Catwoman. I am now Catwoman. I do. I very. I have a very like New York boho chic thing going on right now. Right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Compliance Corner. I'm Orly Burlov, and this is Noel Vestal, also known as Catwoman. Yes. Right. If this whole compliance thing doesn't work out for Noel, she was going to try her life um, on the street corners of Manhattan, smoking cigarettes, and uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty gross too. Yeah. Drinking overpriced coffee. And that I can do. Oh. I can drink overpriced coffee. <laughs> and, and like doing like beatnik poetry, you know, just like spoken okay. word poetry on the corner. Oh, yeah, totally. But that. she'll work at a cafe in order to make her make her wages and pay her $2,000 a month rent. $2,000 is a steal in Manhattan. <laughs> that would be yeah. super cheap. I'd also have like 17 roommates probably, I would assume. That's all sounds like... Why is there anything wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Um, you didn't come here to hear about uh, Noel and I jesting about uh, Manhattan real estate. Um, if anyone is listening to this from that Manhattan, you know, let us know what the cost of a studio apartment is these days. Yeah. It's been a while since I've been in New York, so I would like to just love to know. Yeah, uh, me too. What we, what we are talking about today, <clears throat> great follow-up from last week's po uh, last week's video. Uh, which was on DFAR 7019. We'll put a link in the show notes. This week's topic is 7020, DFAR 7020. I love it. You're, you're already dancing. I'm so already excited. I'm already ready. Let's do it. All right. So um, 7020 is one of the three clauses of the DFAR's interim rule. Uh, its siblings are 7019 and 7021. Um, and the interim rule was released in the fall of 2020, but it is in um, place today as a requirement. So it means that you're required to meet 7019, 7020, and 7021 if you are handling controlled, unclassified information. Actually, not 70. Yeah, I was going to say, not 7021 yet. Not yet. Not yet. But 7019 and 7020 are a today thing. Yes. Correct. They are a today thing. Um and so if you're handling CUI and you have a DFAR 7012 clause in your contract, you need to meet 7020. All right. So we've kind of spoken um, in, in uh, kind of veiled references to the 7020 thing. Why, why don't we just go out there, get on record of what is 7020? And that's where I turn it over to you, my friend. I love it. Let's do it. Awesome. So 7020 is probably, in my opinion, out of like the four clauses is probably the easiest one to understand. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if you look at the title, I think it actually just says like assessment or DOD assessment on it. So the idea is that if you have a 7012 clause in your contract, you are agreeing when you sign that contract and you, you give it back to the government and they sign it and they, everything's executed, right? You are agreeing to letting the government, the DOD, come into your organization to do an assessment. And it's not like you're agreeing to let them do it like, when they, when, you know, when you have time right. or you know, when they call you up and you guys have tea and you discuss like, well, maybe in six months we'll do this. No, it is a open door policy that you are signing up for. At any time, the DOD feels in some way that it needs to double check something for you. You have agreed that they are allowed to do that in whatever, you know, different way that they decide Time is up and the DOD is coming. All right. So that's the point number one of uh, 7020. There are a couple of other points that we should get, yes. um, let people know about while you go and hit those. Yeah. So then there, there's also the different types of assessments that are sort of, you know, listed inside of 7020. So DIBCAC, which is the DOD, you know, the DCMA branch of auditing for, you know, cyber related security stuff, you know, primarily 7012 and then eventually, you know, and also CMMC related stuff, but that's not the point. DIBCAC is a group of individuals who, for whatever reason they decide, they can do this randomly. That's something they've started doing quite a bit in the past year. They can also do it at the request of a whistleblower. They can do it um, if a core or a KO or a contracts person asks them to. There's like, they can also, this is, a, this is the fourth option that people forget. You can volunteer for one of these assessments. You can, I know, nobody, nobody talks about that. Yes, you can call up the DIPCAC and be like, hi, I'd really, really like you to assess me, which I think is wonderful, but people are surprisingly negative about it. 
I was I, like, why? Why would you not want a government agency welcoming, you know, just coming in open arms? Anyway, I just. But um, so those are the kind of the ways that you could end up in a situation where the DIBCAC would come and do an assessment for you. But there's two main types of assessments that they're, the DIBCAC would be performing. The first one is called a medium assessment, which is kind of a weird misnomer because it's it's really they're addressing whether or not you are you are dealing with your DFARS 7012 compliance requirements correctly. And DFARS 7012, as we know, includes the NIST 800 controls, those 110 CUI-based safety security controls. So on the medium side, they want to assess whether or not you are doing those 110 controls, but they only want to see it in like what they call a paper audit. Okay. And a paper audit is exactly what it sounds like. They just want to see your paper. Where are your receipts? Okay, right. you see you're doing this. It So we talked about 7019 last month last time, right? 7019 is I put this score in. I am 110 out of 110, baby. I got this. And I'm going to walk away and it's all going to be great. Well, if you have a paper audit, they're going to say, well, it says that you have 110 out of 110 on Spurs. Where are the receipts? Yeah. How do I know that you have 110 out of 110? What you think it means. You think it means something, but like, I don't think that's true. And then you have to produce evidence and pay, usually what, what usually what happens is that they just want your system security plan and then any sort of like coordinating documentation you might have with like a third party provider, like a cloud service provider, like we are, you know, like a customer responsibility matrix. And that's pretty much it they usually ask for. However, if they start going and diving into this paper audit and they figure out that you are absolutely not 110 out of 110 just based on your paperwork, right. they will then say, okay, we're going to have to do a high assessment. The DIBCAC high assessment is the exact same process, except they come on site. So DIBCAC comes and knocks on your door and has conversations, interviews people in your organization, you know, gets actual examples. Like, you know, you'll send on a call with somebody and they'll say, can you show me an example of how you do this control? You have to bring up the screenshot. Here it is. You know, here's the coordinating procedure, blah, blah, blah. So it's a much more involved process, usually takes, you know, like a week or so, depending on the situation. But that's a DIBCAC high. DIBCAC high assessments can also happen. So randomly. DIBCAC medium, you were just talking about the DIBCAC medium. Yes. So okay. medium is the medium is the paper one. And then if they decide the paper one isn't enough, right, then they, they can will do the crash it up. They can, they can crash your party and come and be like, I'm right here. Let's do this. And again, they're not going to ask you. They're not going to be like, hey, what time works best for you? Is it Tuesday? You know, they're, at that point, you're in a situation where you're very much at the mercy of the DIBCAC because they think that there is a possibility that you are you are lying. Right. And if that's the case, that's not a place you want to be in, believe me. And on top of that, the DIBCAC high assessments can also happen a different way. A DIBCAC high assessment can just randomly happen. Like there is actually an option to just like randomly have one. So that's actually happening more and more in the past, you know, past year, I'd say definitely in the past right. six months, there's more and more of that. And on top of that, there's, yeah. So that's a great question. Why is that? Because all this time that everybody's been waiting for like the CMMC final rule to come out and, you know, and everything else, we still have a 7012 requirement and there hasn't been a whole lot of double checking on anybody actually doing that. So the U.S. government was like, you know, we should probably put something in place here where we can double check on everybody. So that's why the June memo that we we also have, you know, a compliance corner about the June memo that came out in June of 2022, asking, you know, for contracting officers and KOs to do sort of their own little paper audit, if you will, not like an official audit, but just sort of look at the SPUR score versus, you know, what you actually have on paper, kind of like what the DIBCAC does, but on a smaller level. You know, that kind of stuff is now happening. There's also the CCFI, which is the the Civil Cyber Fraud Initiative, which is a division of the False Claims Act. They are already starting to go out and find different organizations who are not compliant with 7012. Again, so there, there is a lot more, there's a lot more avenues now than there were a couple years ago, even, even two years ago. There's way more avenues now for the government to double check on you and really figure out, are you actually doing what you say you're doing? And if you're not, then the False Claims Act can come into play and nobody wants that. Yeah. So we, I think we pretty well um, quantified what ha what the clause means in 7020 that you have to let the government in. There are a couple of other clauses there. Uh, one on 
uh, making sure that summary level um, scores are available in the SPRS. I mean, that refers to 7019, but it says contractors must ensure that the 7020 clause is included in contractors and given to subs. And uh-huh. that, and that uh, your subs also need to make sure that they have their SPRS score in order. Yep. Yeah, that's a big one that a lot of, um, that's recently, I'd say probably in the, probably the last half, later half really of 2022. So pretty recently, a lot of subcontractors are starting to get that push down from their primes because it does state very clearly, you as the, like, if I'm a prime, especially if I'm like a big company, right, where I've got, you know, tons of employees, I am not going to be put in a situation of false claims because of this little subcontractor that I, that I work with, right? Like I'm not going to do that. So a lot of subcontractors are starting to feel so much pressure from their primes because of that specific statement. Subcontractors have to do this as well, but the prime is inevitably responsible. Right. So like the sub could get in trouble, but the prime. They're in local campus. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So that, that flow down is definitely making a lot of primes very um, nervous for the you first time. Me that you uh, were in a situation today where you were speaking with one of our sales guys to a customer on this. I very was. Day. Can you, yeah. can you reveal anything about that? Absolutely. So I had a, I had a call with, um, with one of, it was a per, prospective customer who actually is now a new customer as far as I know. Um, who said very, very frankly that their prime had made it clear to the company that they will discontinue using them. Like it's done if they did not become NIST 8171 compliant. Right. And I, when I asked him how long he had, he goes, oh, immediately. Like, <laughs> not collect $200. Right now. So this is happening more and more and more and more where, again, primes are just like, we're not messing with this. This is not worth it. We're not... They're going to put that liability on the subcontractor and not on themselves as much as they can. And the only way they can do that, well, one of the most effective ways of doing that is saying, well, I'm not going to work with you anymore if you don't do this. Yeah. I mean, that that's a very effective way to get somebody to do what you want. Right. Yeah. Definitely. I get, I get that. Um, so you always have your compliance hat on, but as um, kind of a compliance therapist, which is what I think you could, kind of the role you play on the other side of the screen there. You like it? Um, is what do you tell a contractor who sees the 7020 clause? Uh, what do they need to do? I mean, the biggest thing, the biggest, most important thing is don't freak out. Like, it's <laughs> going to be okay. okay. We're going to talk through this. Everybody's going to be okay. Freaking out doesn't help anything. So that's the biggest thing because it is kind of, it's overwhelming when you start looking at a bunch of clauses in a contract. A lot of the people who work for the DOD are not lawyers, right? They're not legal people. They're not compliance people. They don't have any idea what a lot of this stuff says. A lot of these companies are very small and they don't have lawyers to look at their contracts. So it can be very overwhelming to look at it and be like, okay, there's like 17 of these. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, The most important thing is to remember that if you can get your NIST 800 house in order, if you will, right, for your organization, then you're going to be okay. Because 7020 is only scary if you aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. 7019 right. is only scary if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And 70, 7012 is the same thing. All of the DFARS clauses, if you're not following directions, <laughs> we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Hard. It I is. I get, either. I get it. I am not trying to in any way in any way downplay how difficult, I mean, I've done it myself. It is not an easy, it's not easy to go through this truly, but it is something you're supposed to be doing right now. And whatever your score is in Spurs needs to be reflected in your company in a way that you can prove. And that's really what it is. As as long if you sit here and listen to us and you're like, you know what? I already do 7012. I've got this handled. My documentation is rock solid. If anybody knocked on my door, I'd be like, here you go. And I would feel super confident. That's awesome. Like, we're so glad for you. Unfortunately, that is not the majority. What, like 85%? (laughs) That is an ideal. And there are some people who are in that place. And that's fantastic. There's just not anywhere near as many as there should be. What it, I, I think that art, there was an article I read a couple months ago that was like, you know, they found that like 85% of the DOD 
is not actually yeah. really doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? That's an insane number. So that means only 15% of you out there are actually following directions and the other 85% are. not That's not great. So that's what we're trying, that's what we're trying to convey here is how important this is. This is not something that's going away. You're not gonna suddenly not have to do cybersecurity compliance. If anything, it's just gonna get more so, not less. You know I, I think I'm realizing a problem here. See, I think everyone oh. in the did wasn't in fourth grade with me in Mrs. Bradford's class because she always said, read the directions and then fill out the worksheet. Always read the directions. Thank you, Ms. Fill out the worksheet. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. She's 100% right. Make sure, I know we've said this old probably by now, but I think so. We've, we've said this so many times before, but it really does, I think it's, it really does deserve repeating. Read your contracts. Read all of your clauses. Yep. Read all of your clauses, understand them, make sure that people in your organization understand them who need to understand them. This is so imperative. And if you have questions about this type of stuff, then, you know, engage a consulting organization or a technology company like Prevail that can help you with these types of things, whoever it happens to be, but do not wait until you end up in a situation where the DibCAC is knocking on your door because you told them they could. Yeah, because when they start knocking at the door. Nobody so, wants that. If I can, can summarize, right? If you have a DFARS uh, 7020 clause in your contract, make sure you're meeting NIST 800-171. Know that it can be flowed down to your subcontractors. They have to meet NIST 800-171 and have their SPRS score um, filed their, um, in the database. Mm -hmm. um, and am I missing anything? And remember that a medium audit can turn into a high, a high audit. audit. Yeah, there you go. That's so much. We don't want that. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants that. Nobody does want that. All right, uh, Noelle, I think we've given people enough to think about for this week's Compliance Corner. Um, as always, you know, shoot out or send, reach out with an email if uh, you have any questions. Uh, compliance at prevail.com. Did I get that right? You sure did. I did. All right. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us for these uh, few minutes. Uh, it's been a pleasure as always, and we look forward to seeing you on the next compliance episode.